We as cosmologists like to say that we um, have a pretty good understanding of 13.8 billion years of cosmic history. It's quite impressive when phrased in terms of energy scale. Our observations are limited to a rather small, small range. Um, so, Gilden, uh, my lecture also uh, the onset of the hot Big Bang evolution. If uh, activity we have to an earlier period around three, but that leaves out all these much higher energy scales from earlier times. What's going on? There's a lot of discovery space up there at high energy where the, there might lie some answers to some big open problems in cosmology and particle physics. Things like what is the nature of um, things like what are the fundamental ingredients of our universe. History to disentangle um, what happens at the fundamental physics. All right, so first of all, um, I should explain what's in the title of my talk. Um, we got there, which is that I might be talking about some higher mass particles in principle, which were light uh, at BBN, if I get to that at the end of the talk. Only in the early universe, and they're uh, they stuck around, um, and so their their energy density is non negligible throughout a second fraction. Energy physics. Um, you often hear that the early universe um, acts like a particle collider. This discussion of light relics is one way in which that's actually true. It's not just a slogan. Um, we really do care about the way that the particles interacted, the things that we produced. Um, and as I'll discuss, the, the particles that were produced gives us a window into these very high energy physics that can exceed that which is achievable in terrestrial colliders. Um, I'll try to make that sharper as we go, but this is one way in which uh, cosmology really does act like a high energy experiment. All right, so with that introduction, let's start with um, some discussion of the thermal history. The thermal history is gonna be uh, an important aspect of how it is that we can leverage CMB observations um, to get that access to that high energy information. Um, what I mean by that is that we had particles and antiparticles. All of that is described by a single parameter, which is just the temperature. So things were in local thermal equilibrium. All of the number densities, energy densities, et cetera, of all the species of particles were determined just by that temperature. 
And uh, collisions and interactions among those particles were so frequent and so energetic that we often produ pair produced these particles or those particles annihilated into other species. For each species, that is a relativistic Fermi Dirac uh, for, the, for the plus sign there, or a relativistic Bose Einstein. Um, distribution with the minus sign. Um, species whose mass exceeded the temperature were Boltzmann suppressed. And what this means is that the collisions uh, were not energetic enough to pair produce these particles. Um, these particles can still annihilate, but you no longer produce them at that. Temperature. And so the particles whose mass is below the temperature will no longer be present in the plasma for all. And typically their energy, or sorry, their number density is exponentially suppressed with this Boltzmann factor the, to the minus energy over um, the temperature, their energy is over T. The energy density of each of the species is relativistic distribution function to the particle um, is, is, we get different answers, um, but they differ only by a constant. So for each boson species in thermal equilibrium, the energy density is proportional to T to the fourth. Um, it's proportional to the number of spin states of that species. So for example, uh, you know, left circularly polarized or right circularly polarized. Um, so G would be two for, for photons. Uh, and then for fermions, it's also proportional to T to the fourth and also proportional to the number of spin states. And then there's just this factor of seven eighths. So the only thing that, that distinguishes um, the energy, we can use this fact to compactly describe the energy density of the early universe as the particle content of the plasma changes. So we can define what's called an effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom, which is given by this G star quantity. And what it is is just simply a sum over the spin states of all the bosons, plus a sum over the spin states of all the fermions, including that factor of seven eighths. And with that definition, um, then we can just say that the total, dis uh, the total energy density just the temperature separately. And we'll see how this becomes important in just a bit. For those decoupled species, we up the spin states, but we keep track of the fact that their temperature differs from the rest of the planet. Yes, it does. And the only reason the top line depends on T is because the sum over these species um, just depends on which particles are in thermal equilibrium, which particles have masses below the temperature. Which evidence of that top line can be seen in this table of the particle content of the standard model. So the temp when the temperature is a mass shown in this table, then that species will contribute to this sum. When it's below, that particle species does not contribute to this sum. Okay. Uh, um, and then, uh, so with this definition of G star, then the energy density takes this very simple form, which we can uh, write just in terms of this quantity G star with a scaling that goes as T to the fourth. 
Um, and there's this big sharp drop here. That big sharp drop is associated with the QCD phase transition. This is where the relative between the original and original universe go from being described by quarks and gluon to instead being described by baryons and adron, uh, baryons and mesons. And that uh, dramatically reduces the number of effective degrees of freedom in, in the plasma. And so that causes a very sharp change in G star. And so this gives us the evolution of G star um, throughout the early universe. The next thing I'll come to is this discrepancy between G star S and G star, uh, which is related to the thermal history associated with the cosmic neutrinos. Um, so first of all, why am I talking about cosmic neutrinos? Well, cosmic neutrinos are uh, an example within the standard model of these light thermal relics. Um, specifically, unlike the other particles we've been talking about so far, um, cosmic neutrinos went out of equilibrium with the thermal plasma when they were still relativistic. When we talked about the top going out of equilibrium, what we meant was that the mass of the top dropped below the, or sorry, the, the temperature dropped below the mass of the top. And so tops and anti-tops were no longer produced. Neutrinos um, are have very low masses compared to the temperatures of, of interest here. Um, however, their interaction with the rest of the plasma does drop below uh, the Hubble rate at some time in the early universe, specifically around about one megahertz. So weak interactions that kept neutrinos in equilibrium with the rest of the plasma became inefficient compared to the expansion rate around one mega electron volt. And at that point, neutrinos stopped interacting with the plasma, but they didn't annihilate. They didn't go away. The neutrinos continued, they persisted, and they underwent a free expansion separate from the plasma. So they started contributing to this decoupled contribution to G star. Shortly after neutrino decoupling, we had another event in the thermal history of the universe, which is electron positron annihilation. So it's a temperature drop below about half a mega electron volt. Electrons and positrons can no longer be produced in the collisions in the plasma. Um, they could uh, annihilate and produce photons. And so the annihilation of electrons and protons heated photons relative to the neutrinos. And we can track by how much they were heated by using entropy conservation, which tells us that the temperature drops more slowly for the thermal part because the entropy was redistributed from a plasma of electrons, positrons, and photons to just a bath of protons. And so we can compute the degree to which the photons uh, were heated relative to the neutrinos using entropy conservation. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, as you'll see here, this is just a simple exercise of counting once we have this definition of G star. Um, and so specifically, after neutrino decoupling, but prior to electron positron annihilation, the only species in the plasma were photons, which has two spin states, have two spin states. And then electrons and positrons. So we have the factor of seven eighths here, here. electrons and positrons, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and we have a spin up and a spin down for each of the electron and positron. Yeah. And again, we can calculate G star yeah, to um, at the time uh, of relevance here, just before electron and positron annihilation to the 11. You were saying this contribution, the contribution of the electrons and positrons to G star is no, are no longer is no longer present. And so after electron and positron annihilation, we just have the two spin states of both times. And so G after annihilation is just two. And now, mm -hmm. now we can use uh, now we can use the fact that um, the combination G star um, G star S T cubed uh, is constant um, to determine how the neutrino temperature evolves compared to the photon temperature. Specifically, the neutrino temperature just goes as one over A. It's undergoing a free expansion. The temperature drops more slowly because the entropy from the electrons and positrons was passed to the photons. And putting that all together, what we find is that after the annihilation of electrons and positrons, the neutrino temperature is proportional to the photon temperature. Oh, I sorry, I realize I have a typo here. Um, the ratio of, of neutrino temperature to photon temperature is 4 elevenths to the one third. So there should be a T gamma on the very right hand side here. Sorry about that. And that 4 elevenths to the one third comes from the ratio of the G star S before and after annihilation raised to the power of one third. Okay. All right. And so that allows us to determine the properties of the cosmic neutrino background relative to the properties of the cosmic microwave background, the latter of which we measure very well. Specifically, we expect the cosmic neutrino background 
um, exists, and it has a temperature given by a 4 11th to the one third um, of that of the, of the photons. And that determines pretty much all we need to know about the, about the uh, cosmic neutrino background, or at least it does in the simplified version I've given you. There's a slightly, uh, there's some additional complications um, that are associated with the, the physics of decoupling. So the story I gave you is, applies in the instantaneous decoupling limit when neutrinos um, immediately decoupled from the plasma when the temperature dropped below one MeV. That's not quite how it works. The decoupling process is, is a little bit, um, it's more protracted than that. And it overlaps with the period during which electrons and positrons annihilate. Um, one can take that into account a little bit more carefully. Um, what's being shown here in this plot is the, um, the visibility function for cosmic neutrinos. And if you've seen the visibility function for um, the cosmic microwave background, you'll notice this looks very different. Specifically, the cosmic microwave background visibility function is a function only of redshift or, or um, temperature or whatever. Um, and it has to do just with the number of free electrons that are around at any given time for the most part. For cosmic neutrinos, um, the, the weak scattering rate is dependent on the energy of the neutrinos. And so we get a energy dependent, energy and temperature dependent visibility function, which is shown in this kind of swoosh here. And this swoosh, this visibility function also with the period of electron positron annihilation. There are other transport effects that, that change a little bit the story that I gave you. And in the end, what you get is a slightly larger energy density in neutrinos than is predicted by the standard or by the, by the instantaneous decoupling limit. Now, the way we typically characterize this is in terms of a quantity that we call N effective. Now, N effective is normalized by the instantaneous decoupling approximation. N effective just counts the so-called effective number of neutrino species. It counts the number of neutrino species um, that contribute that amount of energy density in the instantaneous decoupling limit. So in the standard model, in the instantaneous decoupling limit, to be exactly three. These uh, non-trivial transport effects that I mentioned here um, change that number so that N effective in the standard model is actually predicted to be slightly larger. It's predicted to be 3.044 instead of exactly three, okay? Now, the reason this number is useful is, again, because we measure the properties of the cosmic microwave background well. Specifically, we measure rho gamma. And so we can scale everything compared to rho gamma with this normalization. Okay, So I'll often refer for the rest of this talk to this quantity effective and changes to this quantity and effective and how well we measure and effective. Okay. Um, so the way we measure um, and effective um, is through its gravitational impact on the evolution of the universe, and specifically its gravitational influence um, on, the, on the CMB for the purpose of this talk. All right, so just to summarize what I've said so far, um, the story of the cosmic neutrino background is that it was in thermal equilibrium at high temperatures with the electrons, positrons, and photons. Um, when the weak rate with the weak interaction up below the expansion rate, which you can estimate here, this is just showing you um, that the, the weak interaction rate for neutrinos <clears throat> and electrons and positrons scales as G Fermi squared times uh, the temperature squared. Um, so that interaction rate, uh, sorry, the number density times this scattering cross-section gives you the interaction rate. And so overall that quantity scales as to the fifth, uh, whereas H scales as the energy density uh, sorry, the square root of the energy density, so it scales as T squared. So overall, this ratio of gamma to H scales as T cubed. And so that is what gives you this sharp transition. Uh, oh, and sorry, putting in, the, putting in the numerical constants tells you that that transition for when they're tightly coupled to no longer interacting takes place around one MeV with a temperature dependence that scales as T cubed. All right, so um, neutrino decoupling takes place around one MeV. Um, that's followed shortly thereafter by electron-positron annihilation, which heats the photons relative to the neutrinos. Uh, the amount by which the photons are heated relative to the neutrinos can be worked out very simply by counting the degrees of freedom in the plasma before and after annihilation. And that gives us this factor of 4 11 to the one third. And then ultimately, uh, what we predict is that N effective in the standard model is about 3.044, just above the three families of, of active neutrinos in the standard model. Okay, so this is all uh, great, um, but if, oh yes, go ahead. Oh yeah, thanks. So this, yeah, so this diagram in the top left here, this refers, this is the Feynman diagram 
um, associated with the scattering or uh, production or annihilation of an electron positron pair with a neut uh, neutrino antineutrino pair. And what it is is, is um, that in, we're around a temperature of one MeV. Um, we're working in uh, the effective uh, field theory. It's the four Fermi interaction associated with this um, low energy limit of weak of weak interactions. Yes, and so this is this is the whole diagram um, in this for this effective field theory. But yeah, it's just a single vertex um, that scales as G Fermi. So the coupling constant on that vertex is G Fermi, um, and it scales as the momenta, and the momenta scale is T, which is the scale. And then that whole quantity is squared to get the the cross section. So that's where the scaling comes from. Yes. So we also have a question from Zoom. Uh, does N effective also take into account the very small fraction of electron positron annihilations annihilate into neutrinos rather than photon photons? Yeah, great question. Um, that is associated with some of these transport effects that I've uh, alluded to here. Um, but yes, that's a great question. So it's true that not all of the electron positron pairs annihilate straight to photons. Um, and that is also associated with this fact that <clears throat> decoupling of the of the neutrinos takes place around the same temperature, around the same time as electron positron annihilation. Um, and so there's a non uh, a, a non-zero fraction of those annihilations that go into neutrinos as well. And um, that also contributes to this 3.044. Yes. So is there a neutrino that would be one thing, if you're if you're speaking, tap that thing in front of you. So then, then sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, is there an intuitive reason as to why it's larger? Why it's larger than three and not smaller than three? Um, so it does in part have to do with this question we just got from Zoom, which is that there's an annihilation of um, electrons and positrons uh, into neutrinos as well as into photons. Um, another reason has to do with the fact that the um, the, there are some uh, non-zero mass effects of the electrons and positrons. So they're slightly non-relativistic when they annihilate, whereas the thing we worked out um, indicated, uh, just assumed that they were all relativistic all the time. Um, those are the two basic facts. There are some more complicated details. The calculation has a bunch of interesting physics in it, um, but it's all standard model physics. And so one just needs to be really careful at how, how this gets calculated. Um, and that's what's shown in, in, in this set of papers, you got to be careful about all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the, quick, the quick answer is that the decoupling overlaps a bit with electron-positron annihilation. So it's not strictly true that the electrons and positrons only heat the photons. They heat up the, the neutrinos a little bit as well. There's some residual coupling. So these, uh, yeah, so some of the energy gets distributed to, to neutrinos as well. Um, there are some subtle details associated with the, uh, the fact that neutrinos also oscillate in flavor. Um, so the electron type neutrinos interact more strongly with the plasma than the others. Um, so without neutrino oscillations, you'd expect this number to be slightly lower. So it'd be like 3.03 .03 instead of 3.044. So that factors in as well. But again, it's all standard model physics and one just needs to be careful about the neutrino transport problem to get this number 3.044. Yes. Actually, if, if here, if there's a neutrino that has less electron positron annihilation, which arise in a quantum model from uh, Dirac equation, we have quantum fluctuation, yes? Uh, yes, very good. So there are also, so I've shown here the tree order contribution to the electron positron annihilation. Uh, what you're referring to are what are often called radiative corrections to this process. And so indeed radiative corrections also contribute to this number 3.044. Um, and so, yes, higher order terms in the annihilation process also affect the, the number. And uh, also here, you know that electron positron annihilation can be uh, around the system with a very high magnetic field. So it's uh, some more smaller uh, order and uh, do not take into account this model or it's also something can be, could be possible for calculate. Yeah, good question. So you're asking what specific contributions are included to get this number 3.044. Um, so this set of papers went to um, uh, third order in the fine structure constant. Um, and uh, I believe they are consistent up to third order in the fine structure constant. And so the specific correction you're talking about, I'd have to think about what at what order that comes in. Uh, I think it's included, but I'd have to think, I'd have to think about the diagram. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions up to this point? 
Okay, great. So, so, at the, so far at this point, we have uh, a discussion of the cosmic neutrino background. They act as light thermal relics within the standard model, and we have a definite prediction for their contribution to the energy density after decoupling, which is characterized by this N effective of 3.044. Uh, so that's all well and good, um, but that's not the main reason cosmologists are excited about measurements of N effective. Um, the main reason most folks are excited about measurements of N effective is thinking about light relics beyond the standard model, in addition to cosmic neutrinos. So let me first of all say that light particles, new light species beyond the standard model, are ubiquitous in, ext in well motivated extensions to the standard model. They show up all over the place when one tries to solve problems like this with the standard model. So for example, um, axions are particles that arise in models aimed at solving the so-called strong CP problem, uh, which you can roughly think about as the problem of why um, the neutron doesn't have an observable electric dipole moment. Um, so one, if, uh, if the nature were not fine doomed, one would expect that the neutron should have a large electric dipole moment. We measure it to be uh, much, much smaller than the so-called natural prediction. Um, and so one can invent a new symmetry. That symmetry must be spontaneously broken. Uh, the Goldstone boson or pseudo Goldstone boson associated with the breaking of that symmetry is called an axion. Um, that axion is very light, uh, must be very light in order for this, for this model to work. Um, and so that's a new light species that was motivated for a totally different reason to solve a problem in particle physics, and it might have cosmological implications. In particular, if that particle species uh, of axions or axion-like particles were abundantly produced in the early universe because of some coupling to the plasma, it will contribute. That's particle species will contribute to N effective. Another set of well-motivated examples are aimed at solving the hierarchy problem. So the hierarchy problem is associated with why the Higgs mass is so far below the Planck mass. Um, that's another fine tuning problem that exists in particle physics. Um, the natural expectation for the Higgs mass is all the way up near uh, the cutoff scale for the, the, the effective field through the standard model, which is, uh, which is the Planck mass. We measure it to be much, much lower. Um, and so the question is why is it low? Um, supersymmetry was posed as one means to fix the higher collider constraints. Uh, sort of disfavor the simple versions of, of supersymmetry to solve this problem. But there are other problems that have a lot of implications. Uh, one of which is called the mirror twin Higgs problem, uh, mirror Hin twin Higgs model, excuse me. Um, another one is, uh, is called um, N naturalness. N naturalness is the idea that there are N copies of the standard model of particle content in our universe. And we happen to inhabit the one with the lowest Higgs mass. Um, those other uh, uh, species exist, um, even if they're totally decoupled in terms of particle physics interactions from our own visible sector, um, gravitation was doing to our sector. And in particular, the radiation, the light particle content of those other sectors would still contribute to N effective and would still be visible through cosmological observations. Um, so you can't hide from gravity is the basic uh, message there. Um, Another set of particles that's well motivated is uh, sterile neutrinos. So there are these uh, neutrino flavor oscillation anomalies, specifically short baseline anomalies, where the three flavor model of neutrino oscillations doesn't seem to match with data. Uh, one can bring these into agreement if one considers the possibility that there's an additional neutrino state into which these particles can oscillate, but which doesn't interact directly with the weak bosons. Those sterile neutrinos, um, the ones that solve the short baseline anomaly, um, are also light particles. And even if they don't interact weakly, they contribute uh, to the gravitational, um, they, they, they interact gravitationally and contribute to the radiation density. So they would also show up in a measurement of N effective. So these are just a few examples of uh, where light particles arise. There are many, many more examples. Um, another one that I didn't put on here is that gravitational waves act like radiation from the perspective of the early universe. Um, so gravitational waves are mass, uh, massless particles that propagate through, through, uh, through the universe. They act like radiation. They contribute to the radiation energy density and therefore are constrained with our measurements of N effective. All right. And um, so this is all great. So measuring N effective puts constraints on all those kinds of extensions to the standard model. But phrased that way, it sounds kind of like a fishing expedition. Like we can, we put constraints on these things, but, but who cares? Um, maybe their, uh, their density is just low. 
However, thinking back to the thermal history of the universe, we can actually define very clear targets for certain kinds of light relics. Specifically, any light relic which had ever been in thermal contact with the plasma of the early universe will make a definite prediction to an effective, which we can calculate because we know the particle content of the standard model. So specifically, just like neutrinos decoupled at a specific time in the history of the universe, and we know the particles that annihilated after neutrinos decoupled, we can therefore compute the degree to which photons were heated relative to the neutrinos. That whole story carries over to any new light species. So if we had a new light species that decoupled at some earlier time, at some higher temperature, it doesn't just go away, um, it gets diluted relative to photons due to the fact that particles have annihilated since it decoupled, uh, but its energy uh, doesn't go away. It's, there is still a background of those light thermal relics, and they still contribute gravitationally to the evolution of the universe. And we can, con uh, we can compute its contribution to an effective simply by knowing the temperature at which that particle decoupled from the plasma and the spin of the particle. And we can do that because we know all the particles that annihilated thereafter. So the way to read this plot is on the vertical axis is the contribution to an effective from some particle which had been in thermal equilibrium and decoupled at some temperature T freeze out. Um, so you can look on the left side first, if a particle decoupled at 10 to the minus three GeV, which is one MeV, um, and it's a vial fermion, so a particle very much like a neutrino, um, then you can see it contributes one to an effective, as you'd expect from if you had a fourth species of neutrino, it would contribute an additional unit to, uh, to an effective. Particles that froze out earlier have more particle species that annihilated after they decoupled. Photons were heated more relative to that species than, uh, than to neutrinos. And you can read off uh, from the, from the freeze-out temperature the contribution that any of those species would make to an effective. Um, so in particular, if you go to very, very high temperature freeze-outs, um, these things asymptote. They go to constants. The reason for that, the reason they don't keep dropping off at higher, higher and higher temperature is there's a finite menu of particles in the standard model. And so if a particle was in thermal equilibrium at arbitrarily high temperature, only the particle species of the standard model would have annihilated thereafter. And that is the limit on how much these things get diluted, so long as there's not another whole particle zoo out there that we're not aware of. And that sets very clear targets for the minimum contribution of any new species to this value and effective, okay? Um, this in turn gives us, uh, if we can measure an effective to the precision uh, commensurate with these targets, gives us sensitivity to very, very high energy scales in particle physics. Um, specifically, um, the freeze out temperature is associated with the coupling constants of these particles. So you can go through a similar calculation to what we did for neutrinos to work out the interaction rate that any new species has with the standard model stuff. Um, this lambda is associated with the energy scale of the interaction. And what you can see is that you get sensitivity to very, very high scale interactions, um, as long as we can measure an effective to a high precision. Um, also shown on this plot are the current constraints from the Planck satellite. I'll say how we get this in a little bit. Um, and then some future sensitivity that we expect from upcoming experiments. Now, this is where this QCD phase transition becomes an important, um, important point. So right now, what we can say from current observations is that we didn't have any new species, uh, new light species beyond the standard model that decoupled after the QCD phase transition. For if they had decoupled after the QCD phase transition, they would make a contribution to an effective that was shown by these lines to the left here. And that would exceed our current bounds. Um, however, if we can uh, improve our sensitivity to an effective, we can push our sensitivity to much higher uh, T freeze out and therefore much higher energy scales that are associated with the couplings of these new light degrees of freedom, okay? And so our goal is to measure an effective with as much precision as we can and get this sensitivity to very high energy physics, okay? All right, we're at about 40 minutes, so this might be a good place to break, but I'm happy to take questions before we do that if there's any anything that people wanna bring up. Okay, great, so let's take a little break. Uh, back in 10 minutes. Is that right, Dragon? Okay.
first thing about the trend here is uh, yeah. the earlier the particles decouple from the best, that means the weaker the next. Okay, I think we're ready to start. All right, I think we're we're ready to start the second half here. <laughs> okay, um, there were a couple of questions on Zoom, which I'll quickly address before we get into the second half, which is how do we measure this quantity and effective that I that I mentioned. Um, all right, so the first question, why is there a bump at T freeze out uh, between 10 and 100 GeV? Um, so that's right around here. So the easiest way to answer that is to go back and show you G star. I can just tell you it's not labeled, but this is where the weak bosons and the Higgs, bos Higgs boson annihilates. So let me just quickly show you that with G star. So that bump that I was pointing at is associated with this transition here. So the, um, the whoops, the, the weak, uh, weak bosons, um, the WZ, and then the Higgs uh, annihilate there. So that's why that bump is there. Uh, the next question is, um, are, are sterile neutrinos not totally ruled out by current CMB constraints on N effective? Um, the answer here is a little bit complicated. Um, fully thermalized extra species of sterile neutrinos um, are indeed totally ruled out by our current constraints, specifically because you can see our current constraint is, is here, um, an extra fully thermalized species of neutrino would contribute one to delta N effective. The constraints are down here around 0.3. Um, however, you can play little games with sterile neutrinos such that you don't fully thermalize the extra state. Um, and so if you change the mixing angle, um, you can avoid fully thermalizing, fully populating the extra sterile neutrino state. Um, and uh, so you play games with the mass and the, the oscillation, uh, the, the uh, yeah, and, and so, right, so you can avoid the constraint from, from uh, cosmology. Yes. So uh, in that G, G star plot, so what's the difference at the end, the two lines? What's three the difference uh, on the far right here? Yeah, 3.94 and 3.3. Yeah, so the top one is G star S. That's the G star, the effective number of degrees of freedom, relativistic degrees of freedom that contribute to the entropy. And then the bottom one is the effective number of relativistic species that contribute to the energy density. The reason they differ is because neutrinos are decoupled around uh, after one MeV. And so um, the neutrinos are still relativistic and still contribute both to the energy density and the entropy density. But because the entropy scales differently with the uh, temperature than does the energy density, uh, the G star S is slightly larger than G star T. Just to be slightly more clear, G star S goes as the decoupled temperature to the, uh, to the third, and G star uh, goes as T to the fourth. Oh, thank you. Other questions? Okay, uh, all right. I'm going to try to make this thing go away if I can. Uh, can I just put it up there? Is that okay? Yeah. We can also make it completely disappear. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think we're good. Okay. So, uh, so far, I've, I've tried to motivate for you why we should care about an effective. Um, in the second half of this talk, depending on how far I get through, I'm going to tell you how we measure it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say is how we measure it with the CMB. Um, so there are two big impacts that an effective has on our observations of, uh, or sorry, has on, on the appearance of the CMB power spectrum. The first is associated with the mean density of the extra relativistic degrees of freedom. Specifically, it's associated with this process of diffusion damping of the CMB. Uh, diffusion damping is the idea that the process of recombination takes a finite time. It's not an instantaneous transition from tightly coupled to free streaming photons. And while, ready, uh, while recombination is, is unfolding, while the photons are decoupling, um, the random walk of the photons from hot spots to cold spots and cold spots to hot spots um, equilibrates those temperatures, equilibrates nearby areas in temperature a little bit. And so that process of diffusion damping 
washes out structure, washes out temperature fluctuations on scales smaller than the free streaming link. Okay. That damping scale, the exponential suppression of the small scale fluctuations, scales um, as shown here. So RD is the length scale of the damping from this diffusion process. RD squared is some integral over the scattering rate of photons with free electrons, which is given by the Thomson scattering cross-section times the number density of free electrons um, multiplied by the expansion rate during this epoch. Um, and so it's that whole thing, um, the inverse of that whole thing. Uh, the most important for our purposes right now is that H through the Friedman equation is determined by, uh, in part, by N effective. So if I increase N effective, I increase the energy density. H squared is equal to the energy density with some factor. And so increasing N effective increases H. And so it changes the damping scale, okay? Now, if you look at this equation, what you might guess correctly is that increasing N effective should reduce the damping. However, what you will typically see is exactly the opposite um, in plots like this. And the reason for that is what we typically do when we talk about the effects of, CM, of, of N effective on the CMB is we fix the quantities that are very well measured already. And so specifically, if we fix the sound uh, horizon scale, theta S, um, then uh, the effect goes in the opposite direction. And the reason we do that is because we measure theta S really well in the data. So changing an effective, if we allowed it to change theta S, wouldn't agree at all with the data. What we have to do is fix theta S, move an effective around with the fixed theta S, and that causes the effect to go in, to go in the opposite direction. And so what you can see is that increasing an effective leads to more damping, uh, further damps the small scale fluctuations in the CMB. Um, okay, and so uh, this is the primary, this is the largest fractional effect that N effective has on the CMB power spectrum. It, it uh, in, uh, with theta S fixed, increasing N effective increases the amount of damping. And so the clearest picture of how we try to improve our measurements of N effective with the CMB is to better measure the damping scale. Um, and we do that by measuring small angular scale fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. Okay, it's also worth mentioning at this stage that. Um, N effective is not the only thing that impacts the damping scale. Um, you'll see NE, the free electron density, appears here. You can change the free electron density by changing um, things like the helium abundance. So because helium recombines before hydrogen, if I increase the helium abundance, I've reduced the number of free electrons that are around at the time of hydrogen recombination. And so changing the helium abundance also affects the damping scale. Now, in the stand, uh, I'll come back to this. I, actually, let me, let me not say that. I'll come back to, to that later if I have time. There's another way in which um, changing an effective impacts uh, the CMB power spectrum. Um, Gil gave a very nice introduction to this, uh, to this animation already. This shows how acoustic oscillations form in the CMB, how you start with an overdensity and you have these different fluids, dark matter, the photon baryon fluid um, and neutrinos. They propagate outward. Uh, neutrinos, as Gil already pointed out, free stream. Um, that is, they have a, they travel at the speed of light, uh, which is faster than the sound speed in the plasma. And because those neutrinos shown in green in this plot, uh, rush ahead, rush out of the perturbation ahead of the photon baryon plasma peak, um, these things are all interacting gravitationally. The photons pull that peak toward larger scales toward larger physical scales. And so in the absence of, uh, of the neutrinos, you'd have the peak at some specific place dictated just by the sound, uh, the sound physics in the plasma. With the neutrinos, because they rush ahead, they, they stream out faster and they gravitationally tug on that feature, it pulls it to slightly larger scales. Um, because you're pulling features to larger scales in the power spectrum, that shows up as a shift to the phase of the acoustic oscillations. And because you're shifting things toward larger physical distances, you're shifting things towards larger angular scales, which on a power spectrum plot goes to the left, goes to lower L. And so what you can see um, is this is a plot that shows uh, what happens due to the perturbations. So there's a change to the amplitude, changing the radiation density just changes the, the amplitude of fluctuations in the radiation. Um, it turns out that's really hard to measure. And so if you fix that also, 
Um, what you're left with is just a shift to the phase that comes from the fact that these, this free streaming radiation is tugging that feature to a larger angular scale. The bottom panel is just a zoom in um, to show you that this is really just a phase shift. And so as you increase N effective, you go to redder colors and you shift all of the features toward larger angular scales toward lower L. Now this phase shift is, uh, has been measured in real data, has been measured with Planck data. Um, it's uh, a very useful signature of these light relics because it's, uh, it's not degenerate with anything else. So I sort of alluded to the fact that changing the free electron density can change the damping scale. This effect is really hard to mimic um, uh, because it's dictated by causality. You really require that something is propagating outside of uh, the sound horizon in order, to, in order to get this effect, which is a very characteristic signature of, of free streaming species. Um, okay. Good. So this phase shift is, uh, it also allows us to distinguish between new radiation that does free stream as compared to new radiation that doesn't free stream. So all the, uh, I, I talked about many new particle species that might exist beyond the standard model. It could be that it's, uh, that you have some new radiation like species that self interacts. That self interacting radiation fluid wouldn't propagate at the speed of light. It would also have a sound speed that goes, uh, that goes uh, CS squared is, is equal to one third. Um, that wouldn't result in this phase shift. And so one can disentangle free streaming radiation from fluid like radiation using this phase shift. Okay, and so what we do when we actually measure an effective from the data, we don't isolate, or we typically don't isolate the damping scale and this phase shift, we put it all together. And when we do that with um, Planck data, what we get is this constraint here, an effective is equal to 2.99 plus or minus 0.17. So I already showed you the constraint, but here I'm showing you the central value agrees very well with the predictions of the standard model. And that limits um, what is allowed for additional contributions beyond the standard model contributions. Now, as I said, because the effects of N effective are primarily showing up on small angular scales, that dictates a strategy for the way we go about improving our constraints on N effective. In particular, because changing N effective affects the damping scale, we are interested in measuring small angular scale fluctuations in the CMB. Um, and doing so requires that we fight against the noise um, so the CMB power spectrum falls off exponentially in the damping tail regime, but our noise is roughly constant in angular scale. Um, and so it turns out that the best strategy to go after improving constraints on ineffective is not to dig really deep where you're fighting against the exponential fall off of the signal, but instead is to observe really wide. And uh, the, the reason for observing really wide is you get more independent modes by observing more sky rather than digging really deep and fighting against the exponential fall off. Um, I just added this slide. This one's not in the PDF. I added it uh, mostly because Gil said that nobody has plotted the, the, um, the CMB correlation function. This is from one of my papers in 2016 um, <laughs> where I plotted the correlation function of the CMB. Um, I, uh, uh, I wasn't going to talk about this, but there's, so there's actually a lesson here. So Gil, Gil spoke very nicely about the correlation function and how you can see this angular feature that is associated with the baryon acoustic oscillations in the correlation function. Um, and because uh, the, the N effective affects the, the angular scale at which this thing occurs, um, you want to measure this, the peak, the, this location, this acoustic oscillation feature as, as tightly as you can. Um, as Gil will talk about tomorrow, um, one thing that impacts our ability to measure that angular scale is CMB lensing, which smooths out the acoustic oscillations, or in the correlation function, it smooths out this little, this little bump. And so what I'm showing here is that you can actually measure and reverse the effect of that CMB lensing and actually sharpen that peak. But anyway, I mostly plugged it. I just wanted to, to connect to Gil's talk. Um, okay, uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna do a rapid fire discussion of cosmic neutrino, massive cosmic neutrinos, and then I'll probably have to skip the BBN stuff, but please do ask me about it later. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so in addition to uh, measuring N effective, there's a different property of cosmic neutrinos in particular that we can measure, which is associated with the fact that cosmic neutrinos are massive. Um, all neutrinos are massive. We have very good evidence that neutrinos have mass from flavor oscillation experiments. Um, we measure the mass squared splittings of those neutrinos very well, um, but we don't measure the overall scale from laboratory experiments, 
nor do we measure the ordering of those masses. So there are two possibilities, uh, the so-called normal ordering, in which the smaller gap between the masses is between the lightest two, and then the inverted ordering, where the smaller gap is between the heavier two. Um, those two cases predict uh, um, uh, a minimum sum of masses of the neutrinos. Um, and the sum of masses is an interesting quantity because this is what we measure in cosmology. We measure the sum of the mass eigenstates of neutrinos. In the normal ordering case, this minimum sum of masses is 58 milli electron volts. And in the inverted uh, ordering case, it's 105 milli electron volts. Um, our current constraints on the neutrino mass, which I'll talk about how we get those in just a second, is that the sum of masses is less than about 120 milli electron volts. And so the key idea here is that we're zeroing in on a cosmological measurement of the absolute mass scale of neutrinos, um, which, is, which is an interesting, interesting statement. Um, the basic way in which we are sensitive to the mass of neutrinos through cosmology is again through gravitational effects. And I'll, uh, I'll spell this out in a little bit more detail in just a second. But before I do that, let me first say why we should care. Why do we care about measuring the mass of neutrinos? A skeptic might say, um, we already know from neutrino flavor oscillation experiments, we already know the minimum mass and the upper limit from cosmology is already comparable. So we already effectively know the overall mass scale of neutrinos. And so what I'm gonna to try to motivate in the next slide is why should we care? Why do you care that uh, we measure the actual mass scale of neutrinos with cosmology? Um, so there are basically three reasons um, that I'd like to advocate for. Um, the first is particle physics. So knowing the number is useful. You might say we already know the number. Um, that's true, but there's a different sense in which we have a large range of possibilities. And this relates to setting targets for laboratory measurements of neutrino mass, the effects of neutrino mass. Um, so in particular, neutrinoless double beta decay is one method by which we can go after the absolute mass scale of a particular combination of the masses of neutrinos. Um, and there's a wide range of possibilities that's still allowed for the signal that would show up in such an experiment by the cosmological constraints. Um, that can change drastically as we push this down or make a measurement. If we were to make a measurement of the neutrino mass that uh, was at the upper range of what's allowed right now, that would mean it's likely that neutrinoless double beta decay experiments in our lifetime could actually see something. If we see something near the minimum, it's very unlikely that any of us will live to see neutrinoless double beta decay experiments uh, detect neutrino mass. Um, with that being said, it's also uh, useful to know um, that there's different scenarios than the standard scenario that could show up as signals in neutrinoless double beta decay experiments or beta decay endpoint experiments. Uh, and you're probing really different aspects of neutrino mass between cosmology and those lab-based experiments. Um, perhaps of more interest to folks in this room is that we actually learn a great deal about cosmology from making this measurement of the absolute mass scale of neutrinos, not so much for the neutrino's sake, but just because it really serves as an end-to-end -end test of cosmology. The neutrino mass signal is uh, sensitive to the whole thermal history of the universe and also all the way up through structure formation, as I'll talk about in just a second. There's a lot that can go wrong there. If we measure something that agrees with the standard model prediction of the simplest version of neutrino mass, that'll be a, an end-to-end -end test of cosmology that takes into account a whole range of, of possibilities. Deviations from it are strongly constrained when we measure neutrino mass. Um, it also tells us about astrophysics. So right now, the, the scale of the effect of neutrino masses is comparable to the precision with which we know, need to know astrophysical processes when we measure things like the structure, uh, the, the power spectrum from galaxy density or weak lensing. Um, if we nail down the neutrino mass, uh, that will take out one bit of uncertainty for modeling other aspects of, of, of cosmology and, and astrophysics. All right, so just as a reminder, we know very well the properties of the cosmic neutrino background as predicted from the standard thermal history. Specifically, we know that neutrinos decoupled while they were relativistic. They maintain their uh, relativistic uh, Fermi-Dirac uh, distribution with a temperature that we can uh, infer from the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. And specifically taken today, this factor of 4 11 to the 1 3rd implies that the temperature of neutrinos today is 1.95 Kelvin or about 10 to the minus four electron volts. And the number density of this cosmic neutrino background is about 112 per cubic centimeter per species. Um, what this means is that because we know the mass squared splittings and those mass squared splittings imply that at least two eigenstates of neutrinos are more massive than this scale. So at least two eigenstates of neutrinos are non-relativistic today 
and they each have a very large number density of about 112 per cubic centimeter. Uh, so cosmology provides us with a huge abundance of non-relativistic neutrinos. That's something that's really difficult to arrange in the lab uh, because the scale at which neutrinos are produced, the energy scale or momentum scale at which they're produced, is typically the scale of the interaction, uh, which typically involves uh, weak interactions. And so these things typically come out with mega electron volt energies or kilo electron volt energies. Here we're dealing with 10 to the minus four um, electron volt energies. So we're in the non-relativistic regime for these neutrinos. All right, and so the primary impact that the mass of neutrinos has on cosmology is associated with structure formation. Um, neutrinos were produced hot. They were produced as relativistic species and lived most of the cosmic history as relativistic um, species. However, they're non-relativistic today, which means they contribute to the non-relativistic energy density at present. Um, however, their large thermal velocities means they don't act like cold dark matter. Instead, they act like hot dark matter. And hot dark matter doesn't cluster in the same way that cold dark matter does. The large thermal velocities will kick the particles out of potential wells, which means that the, the hot component of the dark matter is less clumped than the cold dark matter component. And in particular, neutrinos are less clumped than cold dark matter. Um, and what that implies is that uh, because we have <clears throat> measurements of the total matter density, and the total matter density includes some contribution from neutrinos, compared to a universe with only massless neutrinos, we expect a suppression of matter clustering on scales below the free streaming length of neutrinos and compared to the clustering at early times on large scales. In other words, what we predict for the matter power spectrum in a universe that has massive neutrinos compared to one with only massless neutrinos is a power spectrum that looks like this, where uh, there's no change at large scales and at small scales, there's a suppression in the power. Now, uh, as I'll say in just a minute, what we're primarily looking for when we're searching for the effects of neutrino mass is the offset between this scale, at, uh, this um, amplitude at large scales and the amplitude of clustering at small scales, okay? The amplitude of that clustering is directly related to the sum of neutrino masses, which is kind of shown here. I'm skipping some of the details, but um, it's, it's a small effect. You can see this is the minimal mass of neutrinos, and you can see the uh, effect on clustering is on the scale of like 4%. Okay, good. All right, so how do we measure this lack of clustering? Um, you'll, hear many you'll hear about many probes of matter clustering throughout the rest of this week. The one I'll focus on today um, is actually gonna be covered primarily by Gil tomorrow, which is CMB lensing. What I'm showing here is a plot of uh, the scales over which various probes of structure growth are sensitive as a function of redshift vertically and of wave number horizontally. As it relates to neutrinos, what we care about is measuring things to the right of this purple dashed line, which shows the regime over which the matter power spectrum was suppressed due to neutrinos. Um, and what we would ideally like to do is compare large scales, things to the left of that purple dashed line, to small scales, things to the right of that purple dashed line. But unfortunately, all of our measurements are primarily sensitive to the right of the dashed line. And so what we need to rely on is a measurement of the matter clustering at late times, compared to some other probe of what it should have been in the absence of neutrino mass. And one way to do that is with, as I said, CMB lensing, um, but we don't resolve that uh, the shape dependence. We don't resolve the suppression. What we resolve is basically just a constant offset due to the neutrino, uh, due, to, due to the neutrino mass. Um, I will let Gil tell you how we actually make maps of the CMB lensing tomorrow, but we can get the power spectrum, which is proportional to the matter power spectrum. And looking at this plot, uh, what you can see is that uh, this is the change to the matter, sorry, sorry, to the CMB lensing power spectrum due to neutrino mass compared to a universe in which there was no neutrino mass. And then uh, shown in blue are CMB S4 error bars that we anticipate from the CMB S4 lensing reconstruction. And just doing statistics by eye, it, like, it looks like it should be an absolute slam dunk to measure the effects of neutrino mass in CMB lensing. However, there are some challenges with that because just measuring this scale is not sufficient to make a measurement of neutrino mass. We need to know what this would have been in the absence of neutrino mass. We effectively need to measure where this dashed line is. And that has some degeneracies. We need to know what the matter density was, which, imply, which uh, dictates how much stuff clusters. And then we also need to know what the primordial amplitude of fluctuations was. And as we'll see, that's tied up with our measurement of the optical depth of reionization. 
the matter density problem will basically be solved with spectroscopic galaxy surveys, uh, which are aimed at measuring primarily uh, the evolution of dark energy. But in doing so, they naturally measure very well the matter density because that affects the expansion rate over the recent history. Um, so this is just showing the expectation from DESI, uh, which is operating currently, which will give us very good constraints on H of Z, uh, the expansion rate as a function of redshift, which will give us very tight constraints on omega matter, basically resolving the de degeneracy that we expect with neutrino mass. The other degeneracy is associated with the amplitude of scalar fluctuations. What we measure really well from the CMB is a combination of the, sca the scalar primordial amplitude AS um, times e to the minus two tau, where e to the minus two tau is a, an effect that comes from the smoothing out of features from uh, reionization. So tau is what we call the optical depth to reionization. It's uh, due to the fact that free electrons were produced after the first stars and first galaxies turned on and ionized the universe. And so some CMB photons rescattered that smoothed out fluctuations on small scales. Um, it's that combination, AS e to the minus two tau, that scales almost all of the scales in the CMB, temperature and polarization power spectra. Fortunately, there's this bump on very large scales called the reionization bump, which is sensitive not just to that combination, but to tau squared. And that's due to new polarization that's produced by the scattering of CMB quadrupoles off of free electrons that were produced in the late universe. And it's this reionization bump that we can use to disentangle AS from tau. Um, and that allows us then to set the scale for where we expect the clustering would have been in the absence of neutrino mass. It turns out that this degeneracy is one of the most important in determining our sensitivity to neutrino mass. And let me just demonstrate that um, with uh, this plot which shows uh, our sensitivity to neutrino mass as a function of our uncertainty on that optical depth tau vertically, and the noise, the roughly speaking, how, how precisely have we measured the CMB on the horizontal axis. Um, the units on the horizontal axis scale, um, so uh, moving from say eight to four requires a factor of four in cost of the experiment. So there's a very rapid scaling to go to the left uh, on, this, on this plot. But what you can see is you don't get much improvement on your constraint on neutrino mass and going left to right, but you do get a significant improvement moving up and down. And so neutrino mass will primarily be improved by our measurements of uh, tau going from the current Planck measurement down to a future satellite measurement from something like Lightbird or, or Pico. Okay. Um, I realize I am out of time, so I think I'm going to skip this topic. It's kind of a big topic. I'm more than happy to answer questions about it, but I think I better stop and not not get too involved in this uh, in this topic. Um, so thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Uh, so you, you mentioned how important it is to get like a better measurement of, of tau. Um, you know, how close are, are we to like actually making some improvement in this measurement by looking at this reionization bump? In, in yeah, good question. So um, what I showed on this plot is that we expect to reach the cosmic variance limit if we have a new satellite. Um, so Lightbird or Pico are both CMB satellites. Now, the reason I've focused on satellites for this measurement is that measuring this reionization bump requires that we measure very large angular scales in the CMB. That's particularly challenging to do from the ground because it requires that you compare the CMB polarization in one part of the sky to a very distant part of the sky. When you do that from the ground, you're looking through atmosphere and you're looking through different columns of atmosphere when you look at two different parts of the sky. Um, so measuring the large angular scales uh, for polarization or for temperature is really difficult, or especially for temperature, is really difficult to do from the ground. There are some proposals that aim to do this faster than the time scale of these of these satellites. One of them is called CLASS, uh, which is aimed at doing large angular scales from the ground. Um, if they succeed, they will meet basically this measurement um, on a shorter time scale, on the scale of um, five years instead of on the scale of like ten years for these uh, for Lightbird in particular. Um, there's also a balloon um, uh, or several balloons that have been proposed to go after tau. Uh, the advantage of a balloon is that you get above the atmosphere and you can get some of the, some of the advantages that you would get from space uh, without the cost, 
um, and you can do it a little bit more rapidly. Um, and so again, that would be on the scale of uh, five years instead of on the scale of 10 years to do this. Yeah. Um, so I was hoping you could just briefly repeat again how we reconcile the fact that neutrinos with mass suppress the power spectrum with sort of the naive intuition that the more you are like matter and the less you are like radiation, the more you expect the cluster. Yeah, great. Um, great. So why, why do we get a suppression in the matter power spectrum from neutrino mass instead of an enhancement? And I think the key idea here is that what is being fixed in this plot is the total matter density. Um, and what that means is when I fix the total matter density, I am implicitly, if I increase neutrino mass, I am reducing the amount of cold dark matter that I have because the total matter density today is a sum of all the non-relativistic matter. So baryons, dark matter, and neutrinos. Um, and so there is a fraction of the matter density that just doesn't cluster in the same way. So that's one effect. There's another effect. Um, so roughly speaking, in, you can pick it apart in this formula, that's this contribution. Um, there's also another effect, which has to do with the fact that um, not only does that stuff not, not cluster, but it was radiation-like at early times. And so it actually smooths out the potential wells to some degree. Um, and that is that results in this logarithmic growth uh, associated with when the neutrinos, uh, 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 when they become not, became non-relativistic in this case. Um, and so, so, right, that's also why in this plot, um, there's an evolution of the suppression with redshift. That's a little bit more subtle, but both of those effects contribute to the suppression. Got it, thanks so much. All right, any other questions? All right, thanks a lot.